Welcome to the Mandela Podcast, where we help you feel your best body, mind, and soul. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, Charlie McDermott, co-host here with Bree Jaworski once again. Bree, how are you? I'm doing awesome. I'm so excited for our guest today. I, you know, I, I noticed uh, you, you brought a guest. I didn't know, you know, Christmas season and Easter <laughs> elves and helpers and all that. I, I wasn't quite sure. I didn't want to ask. No, just kidding. Yes. Uh, and She's our special a- guest. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and who is your guest? So my guest today uh, is Amber. Amber is actually a client of mine that has gone through EMDR therapy. And she was very gracious to agree to come on because it's a little tricky when I have clients, obviously, with confidentiality mm-hmm. and everything. And uh, EMDR Typically, I'll get into it a little bit more, but typically is for trauma related issues. So, you know, just sensitive stuff. And so I worked with Amber and at the end, uh, I don't want to give anything away, but at the end of her treatment, she and I discussed, you know, if she was able to help anyone else or spread the word about EMDR, uh, she would like to do that. So I, I thought of the podcast and I thought maybe it'd be a great idea to have her on and so she could share her experience with it. But again, because of confidentiality and everything, everything's a little bit touchy. So um, yeah, so I didn't know if I'd be able to make it happen, but she has agreed to come on and she's here. So I'm really happy about it. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, Amber. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, Bree, you mentioned the the EMR, e, EMDR, right? Yes. Did I get that right? <laughs> yes, you did. got it right. <laughs> okay. Is what what does that stand for? So the actual uh, what it stands for is a lot even more of a tongue twister than the acronym, ah. but it's uh, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. So that's kind of a mouthful, and so that's why we shortened it to EMDR. And but EMDR can be a little tricky too. <laughs> yes. Wow. Wow. But in a good way. Yes. In the best way. So I want to, um, today I want to go over just what EMDR is. I think a lot of people maybe have heard of it, but they're not exactly sure what it is, what it entails. And so I'm going to give just a brief history of EMDR, how it came to be, um, what it's for, who it would be best suited for and that kind of thing. And then I'm going to just kind of hand it over to Amber and ask Amber some questions about her experience. Cause my main objective today is to try to give an insight into what it would be like for someone coming in for EMDR. Like I want to try to dispel any sort of um, anxieties that anyone might have, or, you know, let them know that, you know, how it's different from typical like psychotherapy talk therapy, and also that it's not scary or anything like that. It's actually, I think it can be, easier than actual talk therapy, but we'll get into that. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to get into EMDR and Charlie, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free. (laughs) Hopefully I can answer them, but we'll see. Um, so I want to get into just, so EMDR again stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And I'm literally going to read, um, some of this just straight off the paper, um, printed out about EMDR, just so the audience gets an idea of what EMDR is. So EMDR processing helps you break through the emotional blocks that are keeping you from living an adaptive, emotionally healthy life. EMDR uses rapid sets of eye movements to help you update disturbing experiences, much like what occurs when we sleep. So during sleep, we alternate between regular sleep and REM sleep cycle. And during this REM sleep cycle, which I think most people are familiar with, this is actually when we, the brain processes things that are troubling us. Okay. So uh, EMDR actually replicates this REM sleep cycle. And so it allows us to go back and uh, reprocess traumatic memories. And so the way I like to kind of explain it to clients coming in is If you think of, I'm very visual, so I like to give visuals, but if you think of the room that you're in as your brain, okay, and so the whole room, every wall is lined with file cabinets. Now, I don't, what is that movie? Is it Bruce Almighty or I don't know, the movie where like they go into the person, I don't know, whatever, but there's a visual in a movie that's something like that and there's just file cabinets everywhere for the person's like experiences in their life. And so if you think of 
you know, your brain being this room with the file cabinets. Okay. So an experience comes in and your brain processes it. Right. So it says, Oh, Amber, you know, ate lunch today. She had a turkey sandwich. So we'll just, you know, wrap that up and put that away in her lunch file over there. Okay. So everything comes in, it's neatly filed away and it's in its appropriate file. Right. So everything's nice and neat. And that way, when we think of recall, so if I were to say to Amber, hey, what did you have for lunch yesterday? She just goes in her file and she goes, oh, I had a turkey sandwich. Okay, easy enough. So what happens though is when our brain is interrupted by a trauma, so you have an experience that's not just eating a turkey sandwich, it's something traumatic, right? So the brain isn't able to process this particular memory correctly. So instead of putting it neatly in its file where it goes and putting it away in its cabinet, it's kind of just, imagine it just bouncing around the room, okay? So it's just like crazy, has crazy inertia just like going around the room, okay? And so that's why a lot of times when we have trauma, we have, we get triggered, right? So certain things. Um, so instead of being able to just recall this memory, like you would with any other memory that's been properly processed, we have this kind of rogue trauma memory that just comes out whenever, you know, you could hear a song or smell something or talk to someone and something triggers you and that memory just floods back. And we don't always have a lot of control over it. Okay. And that's why we have a lot, um, when we're able to process the things correctly, we don't have a huge emotional attachment to them. So again, going back to the turkey sandwich example, like people aren't going to get, you know, really worked up if I ask them what they had for lunch yesterday, typically. Uh, but if I ask them about a traumatic memory that hasn't been processed yet, that might evoke a lot of emotion from them. Okay. So you can kind of tell the difference just with that in the brain being able to process the memory correctly and or being interrupted by trauma and not being able to process it correctly. And so when we go to sleep at night, that's another reason why sleep is so important. But when we go to sleep at night and we have our REM sleep cycle where our eyes go back and forth in succession, uh, that is the point where our brain is able to process all of those things during the, that happen during the day. And so what we do in EMDR was we, we basically mimic that eye movement so we go back to the traumatic event and we reprocess it using the eye movement, but we process it correctly this time. So it, it nicely goes away in its file where it was supposed to go the first time. And that way you can recall it, but you don't have that emotional connection to it. You can recall it just like if I were to ask you what you had for lunch yesterday and not some big, overwhelming emotional thing. Uh, so really good for PTSD, really good for trauma, um, even if... It doesn't reach the level of PTSD, but just, you know, general trauma, anxiety, depression. Um, I've worked with people with phobias, major phobias um, with EMDR that has cured their phobias. That's always really cool to see. Um, there's work with substance. I don't work personally with substance abuse, but anymore, but substance abuse, EMDR is used in that. So there's a lot of different uses for it. And it's, um, I, I'm pretty sure I said this to Amber when I first met her, but it's kind of like the closest thing to like magic that I have available to me as a clinician. Wow. Like sometimes I'm still shocked at how well it works and how, yeah. like, I'm just like, what is this? You know, like, I remember thinking that when I first learned how to do it and got certified in it, like, I remember being like, what is this voodoo? Like, I, I don't know, <laughs> you know, but when you go through it and maybe, maybe Amber can speak to this in a little bit, but I think you kind of like get that same sense. Like, I'm not really even sure what happened or like how this worked, but like it worked. So I'm just going with it kind of thing. So we wow. do know the science behind it, but even knowing the science behind it, it's still one of those kind of like strange phenomenon, you know? So, um, so yeah, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight into just what EMDR is. And now I would like to turn it over to Amber and I'm just going to ask Amber some questions um, about her experience because she actually went through the whole um, EMDR process. And so my hope is that she can give you all just a little bit of insight into like what it would be like for someone coming in, what they might experience. Obviously, it's going to vary from person to person, but I think she can give a really good account of what she went through, um, which was pretty incredible. So thank you so much again for being here, Amber. Really appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I guess 
I'm going to start by just asking you um, for our, our listeners, uh-huh. what was it that made you want to go through EMDR therapy? Well, I have been struggling with PTSD. Um, do I, is it helpful for the listeners to know what trauma I went through or the severity of the trauma? Um, and- I think that's up to you, what you want to share. Um, it's up to your comfort level. I think it could be helpful to them, but I don't want you to feel pressured to share like specific I'm, details about it. I, I No, I, I believe it wholeheartedly if it helps others. Um, because I know what it feels like that. Yes, I'm open. So, um, I was going through a terrible depression. Unfortunately, um, my PTSD started when I was 15 years old from a stocky, a stalker, excuse me, who stalked my sister and I in, in, with intentions to break in and rape. So I could never have said that before without crying. And I am not crying now. Thanks to Brie. Um, (laughs) So um, that happened and then other things had happened with um, another rape later on. And anyways, it was a very violent act the first time. So I'd been suffering with this since I was 15 and I just turned 40. Um, Mm -hmm. So the severity, I would believe, with the complex trauma, you know, added up over the years until you just couldn't deal with it anymore. And it started flooding into every portion of your life and just kind of bring you down everywhere. Mm-hmm. So I decided while going through therapy and medication changes for the depression and the signs and symptoms of PTSD, I was tired of living in that fight or flight state. So I was willing to stand on my head backwards in a corner anywhere for a week. I didn't care. I mean, I was ready to do anything. Yeah. So that, was, and it was also brought up by, um, Adrian Krim. Mm-hmm. She, um, was, what is my therapist also works at Mandela still about part-time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So she's the one that actually thought that, that this would be a wonderful um, treatment for me to go through. Yeah. And so for everybody listening, um, Adrian is one of the therapists that works here for me and she has another job in which she saw Amber and, and referred Amber for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. She's seen that focus that my PTSD was the focus of a lot of the issues and that I couldn't get that reel of trauma out of my head mm-hmm. and, the, and the, the, the triggers and the, the, when you're sleeping and remembering things, the flashbacks or nightmares, the, mm-hmm. the trick I like to, to say those memories that you have processed and or not processed mm-hmm. really are just flashbacks and mm-hmm just a nightmare that throws your body in fight or flight nonstop. Yeah, absolutely. So that was willing to do anything. And I have to say, um, when I first met Amber, when she first came in, uh, and I had no prior experience with her at all, um, I could see, I mean, obviously, like, I'm a trained therapist, but I can see trauma in people's body, the way that they sit, the way that they hold things, the way that they, you know, they have almost um, like a, they're very sensitive to noises and just like a hypervigilance. And I very much saw that with Amber, which is, this is something I've already (laughs) mentioned to her. This isn't news to her or anything, but um, I very much noticed that in the beginning when she first came in, um, just this hypervigilance and um, like, she seemed very like on high alert, you know, just uh, very high stress, like high, what you would, if you didn't know someone, what you would, would consider to be like a high strung person, um, kind of on edge. Obviously I knew that there was more going on as to why she was there, but um, yeah. So, okay. So let's get to the next question. Um did you know much about EMDR? Um, did you know how it would be different from traditional talk therapy before you started it? I honestly decided that I was not going to research it. I knew nothing about it. And I am medicine, so I don't know. I just had never heard of it. and um, But I chose not to research it because I thought <laughs> if I researched it, which I do everything, that I would, that would get in my head a little bit and I couldn't just be played, if you will, (laughs) Yeah. Um, let it happen. So 
I chose not to do that. And I think that honestly was the best. Then my mind wouldn't be able to control what um, the possible therapy and the outcome of that was going to be. Yeah, I definitely understand what you mean by that. Um, right. And I do, I do remember you saying like, you know, you're in charge, <laughs> like you take the wheel, I'm just here for the ride. Um, and one of the nice things about EMDR therapy, I think, is that you really are able to take more of a uh, submissive stance, I guess, it, in it, because it's not back and forth talk therapy where you have to really, you know, you have to be the one to bring up things. I mean, you know, cause as the clinician, I don't know what's happened to you. I don't know um, what brought you in. You have to be the one to like divulge those things to me. Whereas EMDR, you're able to, you know, we talk about certain things in the beginning, but it's more, um, it's more internal. It's not so much like with the back and forth. Right. But also it's very difficult with someone with PTSD to be submissive because then we cannot be vigilant, hyper vigilant. So that's a great point that is a wonderful aspect to this whole treatment regimen is that you are not only learning to be submissive to someone you do not know, right? You're putting all your trust, right? You don't know if this is safe or not in your body yeah. internally. You just have to go with it. But the, the process is safe. You learn to be submissive, if you will. Yeah, that's a great point, actually. Yeah, yeah you're right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I actually have never thought of it in that way, but you're absolutely yeah. right. It, it takes, um, yeah, a certain amount of trust, I think, to do any sort of therapy when you're being vulnerable with someone that you don't know. Um, but yeah, for, for you prior to this, um, definitely like a hypervigilance for sure that, that I don't see in you anymore, which is awesome. Oh God, no, I'm so calm. <laughs> Yeah. It's really nice to see the changes in you. Um, so what was it like for you as the client going through EMDR? And also, was it hard? Like, can you speak to that? It was different. Like I said, I was giving you all the control, which I was completely fine with. I just felt this trust with you that, you know, most, most of the time you have to build that trust up with people like me, you know, PTSD yeah. survivors, right? Yeah. Um, you have to build a trust. But with you, I don't know what it was, your voice, just your demeanor, everything I just felt this immediate trust, like, all right, mm. this girl's got it. Like, <laughs> she's going to save me. <laughs> but yeah, the process, of course, was interesting, but I was so just ready. So it felt good. Mm -hmm. It didn't even feel strange. Um, I was a little bit nervous when it came down to the big day of yeah. getting into it, just <laughs> like, oh boy. <laughs> but then I thought, yeah. well, who cares? I'm already suffering enough with flashbacks and memories. What's the big deal about having to think about it for 45 minutes while somebody is trying to fix me? Right. Yeah. So it's the same thing. Might as well be going to sleep at night with the flashbacks and nightmares. My, my, might as well sit on your couch and <laughs> do it that yeah. way. Right. Yeah. And so um, just to piggyback off of what uh, Amber just said for anyone listening. Um, so leading up to the actual desensitization part of the EMDR, um, we typically, well, always, we have a few sessions where uh, we basically put some things in place, like safeguards, if you will, we call it resourcing in EMDR, but um, some activities like uh, meditation type activities, I guess would be the best way to describe it to where if the person um, is feeling a large amount of anxiety, like during the desensitization part, we can have some things where we can take a pause and the person can use some of these resources that we go over in the beginning to try to like, you know, bring their anxiety level down. And, um, you know, so we do some prepping, I guess that would be the best way to describe it. We do some prepping before the actual like eye movement part, which is well, what everybody thinks of tools. You provide two tools and that's basically what it is, is your safe zone and your mm -hmm. bunk or your container you're mm -hmm. choosing. And yep. That's the, that's the comfort buildup, if you will, I, I believe to the then harder part that you will come to and you are, you well prepare your patients very much. So at least me, um, <laughs> very on in and yeah, because I think that's the part that, like you said, that's the part that makes 
people the most nervous um, is yeah. was that first session where you're doing the desensitization, right. which we do in my office, we use, I can, so I know you guys are listening, but um, you can use fingers where the person just follows your fingers with their eyes and that creates that back and forth motion with their eyes, but really any sort of bilateral stimulation will work in the same manner. So what we use in my office are called tappers. So they're basically these two little things you hold in your hand. Most people hold them in your hands, um, one in each hand, and they let off like a, a small vibration, And but it goes back and forth, back and forth. So it stimulates that same bilateral stimulation that an eye movement, if you were actually had your eyes open, but it allows you to close your eyes and get a little bit more relaxed and that kind of thing. That's why I prefer to use the tappers. And most people prefer to use the tappers if they have them available to them. There's also a, a couple other things. Um, that other practitioners may use, um, including like a, uh, a light bar. So it, ha it basically it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a bar and it has a light that goes back and forth, which you track with your eyes. And then the other one would be something like usually on headphones where it has like a ticking back and forth. So um, basically anything, like I said, with bilateral stim stimulation will work, but we use the tappers. And so, you know, people are able to like get comfy. I always tell people like bring you know, anything in with you that makes you comfy. If you have a blanket or pillow, I always have that stuff in my office too. But if you have like a special one that makes you feel extra comfy, like bring that in. And, um, and then people sometimes will put them under like one under each leg, or as long as it's one on one side and one on the other, it doesn't really matter. But a lot of people will just hold them in their hands. But um, that's the actual like desensitization part that we keep referring to. Um, so Amber, what in your experience with like, stereotypical talk therapy, psychotherapy, um, would you consider EMDR harder than other forms of therapy? No, I would not. No, I thought it was actually, it's just so different. I don't know how to explain it. It's, it is. I will find a way to explain it because it is so much different than just talking about feelings. Cause sometimes it's like, Oh my God, I don't want to talk about any more feelings, you know? Yeah. Like it's, like it's does it, th this isn't taking that fight or flight out of my system, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, this completely 100% calmed my body down. I truly believe permanently because I still have not had a flight or flight or fight moment yet. That's yet awesome. to any of the triggers that were very awful, right? Yeah. Therapy doesn't do that. However, I truly believe that you still have to have that. Yes. And so for my practice, um, generally speaking, the, the process for EMDR is you start with a therapist and then they assess you. Amber kind of bypassed that a little bit because she knew one of my therapists already. Um, so, but she did get the referral through one of my therapists. So my, re my therapist referred her to me. Um, but she had already assessed her, right? So typically one of the therapists will assess you to see if you would be a good candidate for EMDR. And then usually what people do is they'll start with one of my therapists. They'll come do EMDR with me, which is a short-term therapy. And then they'll go back to their mm -hmm. therapist because we work on trauma, but there's always going to be other stuff, you know, that wouldn't necessarily yeah. be for EMDR, but like is still helpful for like a talk therapy situation. And this is desensitizing your fight or flight, right? That response in your body that causes you to have those hypervigilant moments, right? That those moments that put you into a panic attack or anxiety attacks nonstop. That is like the, the most God awful thing to go through on a daily basis where yeah. then, but the talk therapy still has to be happen afterwards because there's other things that the, those things put you through throughout mm -hmm. your feed that still need to be dealt with. Right. Th right. Such as the depression, like PTSD, you know, the right. depression so plays a huge role in it because of that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, how many sessions did you have before you started to feel the effects of EMDR? Uh, well, we went through four sessions, but our true dig in session, that's what I like to call it. Like our, yeah. we're getting in their session. Um, we did that for one, one thing because mm -hmm. we had our setup days and then, um, the re-eval day, mm -hmm. which was, a, 
Yeah. Um, now I know that everybody's um, severity and story is different. However, the PTSD in people is not different. The signs and symptoms are not different. Right. And it may take others um, a certain amount of time. It still is acute treatment, but it may be mm -hmm. one or two or three weeks. Mine worked really well the first time. Right. It just went that way. But yet, again, everyone is different. Yes. And I think that's important to note. But it mm -hmm. is really, it's a short-term, acute type of of um Yes. Therapy, therapy modality that we use. Yeah. It's not something that you're going to be doing for years or anything like that. It's a very short term type of thing. So usually when I'm scheduling someone that I don't know at all, and I don't know anything about why they're coming in, I, I try to see how many sessions they can do in a week. You know, um, like if they can do three sessions in a week for three weeks, that can, for most people that can be all yeah. that they need. And for Amber, it was even less than that. So, and if it ends up being at less than that, then great, you know, um, but it's not super typical that it would take more than that. So to give you an idea of, if you're used to, um, a, a typical talk therapy type of situation, there's not really any sort of talk therapy that you can do in that type of time frame that will be as effective as right. this. Absolutely not talk therapy is like forever. It feels like, but yeah, very cute. It's like almost like being on an antibiotic regimen for two weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So it's a it's a short term thing. So, yeah. um, can you tell us a little bit about the effects that you experienced after going through EMDR? Well, like you had prepped me that I would have a headache and whatever. So, um, I did always have you know a headache afterwards, but you had mm -hmm. said that. Um, and then after our main session of when we really got into it, I actually, and I don't want to scare anybody. I, I felt like, uh, yes, I had a headache. I was really, I felt very different, but you had said that's because your brain is still processing and it was mm -hmm. for a couple of days, but I was wiped. Like I didn't feel good. I felt sick, but it yeah. was body almost readjusting back to like what maybe a normal person feels like yeah so that's what I contribute that to and it was well worth it I would do it again a hundred times yeah um I, I think that's important to like for people to know that you know not to scare them off but to and that's why right. I tell people like you might feel not great after this like after this session yeah. and so like don't plan after you come and see me on day three day four or whatever don't right. plan on having some big event afterwards or like just plan on kind of being out, you know, right. and not to say you can't drive home or anything like that, but just like take it easy for the rest of the day kind of because you might have a headache or you might just feel kind of out of sorts. Like some people report feeling kind of just like off, you know, like they feel not only just like a headache, but a little anxious or like they just feel like not normal in their body. I don't know. So people have a lot of different experiences, but yeah. Um, but so how long did that last that you felt kind of not great afterwards? I would say after that session and then the whole next day. Okay. But again, everyone's different. Everyone's mm -hmm. body goes through different things. Um, I think, honestly, I think I felt that terrible is because it really worked and it worked that quickly. And I yeah. think it was just my body resetting in some way. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's the only, I mean, I don't want to say the only drawback, but there, you know, it's a small, for most people, a small price to pay for feeling a lot better afterwards. So it's just like getting over that one little hump. And I think, um, you know, for people that have like multiple sessions where we're actually doing the, um, desensitization part, I think that that initial feeling kind of, um, decreases as those sessions go on. Like that first one is the most intense. And then the subsequent sessions are a little less intense. You know, they may have a little bit of a headache or feel a little bit weird afterwards, but not like, you know, out kind of thing. So, right. Um, can you talk to me about, what positive effects you had after the EMDR? Um, I haven't had any fight or flight or panic attacks. Um, I used to, obviously, because of um, this man broke into our home, and not an obsession, well, maybe, with like the locks and the doors, right? I needed to have yeah. that. Money. 
all times and have like plans A through D in case something was to happen. And I had mm -hmm. multiple different plans and scenarios in which I can get out, which is crazy to do. <laughs> right. uh, Understandable though, given what I've you've been through. Any of that. No hypervigilance. I don't sure. jump at a tap door anymore or a window. Um, yes, I still am aware of my surroundings, but right. calm aware. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, how long has it been since you completed EMDR for our listeners? Um, and how are you doing now? When did we do that? Was it June? Shoot. Uh, it was six months. Several months ago, yeah. I'm not exactly yeah. sure. It but. Was summer, so it's got to be almost about six months, yes. And yeah. I'm doing much, much better in the desensitization area. Um, I'm still doing my one-on-one -on -one therapy, of course, because, mm -hmm. you know, that's good. But overall, very, very well. My awesome. body's so calm. Like, oh. And everybody that I um, had been in contact with or ha are in contact with, they have said, Amber, you're so different now. You're oh. so much more. Like, yeah. you just, you seem so light. And it was just mm -hmm. like that. It, it was like, well, I feel light. Like, I feel great. Yeah. I mean, I, I noticed a very big difference in you from the first time I met you. Granted, this was a very short amount of time, as we mentioned earlier, <laughs> maybe like a two week span where we had a couple of sessions, you know, mm -hmm. here and there between, I think we had like four sessions total. So, um, but the person that I met the very first day I met you and the person that left on the very last day, very different night and day. Yeah. Very, very different. And that's, um, oh. so I noticed it. I'm sure the people in your life noticed it as well. Yep. For sure. Yeah, um, so, over here. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess the big question is, would you recommend EMDR to other people? Oh my God. I have been. <laughs> <laughs> I hand over like candy. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. But most definitely, to, especially to vets um, with PTSD, mm -hmm. complex trauma, absolutely substance abuse. Yeah. Any, I think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. I think it could be from quitting smoking to very severe PTSD. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. PTSD. I just think it. I don't know. I just think it's wonderful. It's not even magic. It's just such a blessing. It almost, it, to me, it feels like you cured my inside response to trauma, really. Yeah. And that, that so I could, could be able to fix then the other parts of the trauma that I was suffering along with that. Yeah. If that, does that make sense? Yeah. A Amber likes to give me a lot of credit for this, but, um, <laughs> oh, but I mean, really it's very obviously like as a clinician, you go through the training and you understand like the logistics of how it works and this and that and how to, you know, follow through with the protocol. But it really, I feel like I work a lot harder when I have just clients that are coming in for talk therapy, you know, I work a lot harder, you know, but it's very, yeah, I feel like it's you, like you did it. You change your, your brain is the one who, who did all the work. I barely did anything. I feel like, so, you know, well, it, I got the training to do it. So if yeah. we didn't, it couldn't be done. Yeah. I'm I very think, happy that I did. Yeah, me too. I think <laughs> that that black tunnel little example you gave me, mm -hmm. I did and in the beginning, I'm like, oh boy, what is she going to do to me? <laughs> but then, like once we went through the yes. process, I'm like, oh, I got yes. you. We're in the tunnel, honey. <laughs> yeah. So the black tunnel is um, an analogy I give to people when, you know, because it, you really are in control with EMDR, meaning if you want to stop at any point, we'll stop, you know, but the black tunnel, um, as Amber is <laughs> referring to, is an example of something I give to people like, if you're going through a tunnel and you're afraid of the dark and you get to the middle of the tunnel, it's completely black. And you're like, I'm out of here. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I'm going to say, okay, let's take a pause, but I'm also not going to want to leave you at the middle of the tunnel. I'm going to want to push you a little bit further towards the end of the tunnel where there's a little bit more light coming through. Right. Cause that's right. like the, the height of 
the terror and everything bad that you'd be experiencing would be in that middle of the tunnel. And that's when anybody that's ever wanted to be like, I'm done with this. Like, I don't want to do this anymore is been in that spot, you know, in the middle of the tunnel, so to speak. So we always try to like push you a little bit further just to get you out of that terrible feeling. And, you know, I know that I feel like EMDR can be made almost like sensationalized and like a, or romanticized in a way that like, you know, we're making it seem like it's all, all good things, you know, but it can be very emotional. It can be very, um, Oh, for sure. Emotionally difficult, you know? And, and so people, yeah, sometimes people do cry. Sometimes people do, um, have things like heightened level of anxiety. And sometimes people do want to stop in the middle of it. So, you know, and sometimes people don't experience any of that stuff. So it's really hard because every person's so different to like, let people know what to expect. But that's why I kind of just go over the whole gamut with people. Like, these are all the things that I've seen. (laughs) You know, these are all the things that people have reported that they've experienced. And not to, again, not to freak them out, but just so that they're prepared for anything and just know that I'm there and I'm not going to just like leave them in the tunnel, you know? Well, and the other thing is is you're already going, if you're in this treatment for PTSD, especially, and you're already going through all of those emotions and all of that anxiety and all of that hypervigilance anyway. So why not lay on your couch and try something that might fix that? Yeah. Because you're already going through it. Right. So if you think about it that way, you know. Yeah. It seems probably like nothing compared to what you've been through, (laughs) I'm sure. Right. need to go through and yeah we're going to talk about the memories in the process but you're already having flashbacks and nightmares of those memories nonstop and triggers throughout the day so why not just 45 minutes on a couch and try and tackle that yeah you know absolutely well amber thank you so much for being here you are so brave and i appreciate you being on here so much because i know like i said before like i know it's touchy with like confidentiality and everything and Amber's been like so receptive to just like wanting to help other people and just Mm -hmm. talk about what she's been through because she had a great experience with it and she thinks that it could be really helpful to other people so thank you so much for being here I so so appreciate you thank you (laughs) thank you Amber thanks for listening to the Mandela podcast to learn more about Mandela counseling and health coaching go to www.mandela-counseling.com That's www.mandela, M-A-N-D-A-L-A hyphen counseling, C-O-U-N-S-E-L-I-N-G.com or call 239-360-1983 or visit us on Facebook or Instagram.